Let us begin our service by praising God together. Let us sing.
Danny will now pray for the service. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us a way to still connect with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. God, well, well, we do appreciate that we have our online services and we are able to still communicate with our um, fellow brothers and sisters. Um, I pray that we don't get too comfortable in this new normal that we're living in right now. I pray that uh, we will continue to have hearts that are hungry, not only for, you know, community, but for your love. And I pray that while we're trying to endure right now, um, we continue to strive to get to know you better. Um, I think now, during this time when uh, we have, we really have to rely on our own time um, to seek you. Uh, I think it's a time where we really have to, or we really should focus on growth um, and focus on just incorporating you into our daily lives, Lord. Uh, rather than using Sunday services as a crutch to keep us going, um, and you know make us feel like christians uh now that we don't have that luxury i pray that um, we will all find individual ways to step up um, and to live godly lives without the church in our daily lives god um i want to pray for those that um, are working that are worried um you know and i want to pray for anyone uh, that's trying to make this situation um, work for everyone, whether it be the pastors, uh, whether it be the essential workers, the frontliners. I just pray that you will keep them, you know, in your minds. And I just pray that, you know, we keep our, keep our heads up and that we don't lose faith and that we don't become satisfied with who we've become during these times. And I pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Today the title of the sermon is Boaz Fathered Obed. And we'll be reading from Ruth chapter 4 verse 18 to 22. Ruth chapter 4 verse 18 to 22. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. Amen. This genealogy that we read today is the royal genealogy of King David. So it includes some of his ancestors as it starts from Paris, the son of Judah. And just as any royal genealogy is to a nation, this is an important part of the history of Israel. But at a glance, for those people who do not know David, this might be just a list of names. In fact, even if we know David, this might be just a list of a name to us because it is a list. But this genealogy, for its original readers who knew about the history of Israel and those people who knew who David was and who David was before God, to them, this list was probably a surprise. Because ancient people expected stories and genealogies of their kings to involve mighty battles and mighty heroes to make the king look a lot stronger and better than he actually is. But the book of Ruth that ends with this genealogy, that book is not that kind of story. There are no battles in this story. 
In this genealogy, there are no mighty heroes here. Rather, this story tells us about a foreign girl, a widow, gleaning at a field in Bethlehem, asking for the mercy of the farm owner. And this genealogy is a, as a list of ordinary people, ordinary men. So compared to the other stories and myth of ancient kings, this is a very humble story and a humble genealogy. Yet it belonged to the king who led the ancient Israel to her glorious golden era. However, still for us, it is true that this genealogy is still very dry. We're not that surprised by it because it's not as relevant to us as it was to the original readers. So even if we know David, often we just kind of skim through these passages whenever we run into them. And to be honest with you, I've always skimmed through them because I don't know most of these people who are included in these genealogies. Maybe I know a few of them, but many of them are not even mentioned at all in the Bible outside of this genealogy. So whenever I read a chapter that speaks about genealogy, it was like a cheat day for me because I could just skim right through. And I skimmed through because I couldn't imagine that there would be a message in a chapter or a verse like this. What is there to tell in a list of names? But you see, God, God included this list in the Bible. And for thousands of years, this list was preserved in its place. And everything that's written and kept in the book, in this book called the Bible, is there with a purpose. So, of course, sometimes the readers were not aware of the purpose, just as we often are. And sometimes the human authors might have not been fully aware of the true meaning, the full implication of the text that they were writing. But the true author, the divine author, the one who is telling the story, he always had a purpose. So this genealogy that we read today was always more than just a list because it had a purpose. And it still has a purpose for us today. So this is not just a, a list of names. It never was and it never will be. Because here, God is speaking to us through a name that couldn't have been here if it wasn't for God's purpose. Because this person, he never intended or planned to be included here in the genealogy of his future king. This person was in fact okay with losing his name, losing his riches, and losing his reputation. He was okay with that. He was okay if it was for the well-being of another person, of a foreign girl. But when God saw that, and when God was happy, and when God was satisfied with what he saw in this man, God lifted up the name of this man. And God blessed his family, and God placed him among one of the ancestors who would be respected and admired as one of the fathers of his chosen king, David. His name is Boaz. And today, through the life that Boaz walked, let us hear and praise our Lord who wants to reward us, who wants to bless us even more when we walk according to to his will. But in order for us to do that, we must know the story of Ruth. And we know this story. Many of us know this story. It was during the time of Judges. And this was a time when the Israelites lived their lives as if they had no king. And it was a sad period because, because they had a king. The king that they had was their God. But every man and woman in Israel lived as if they had no king. They lived their own lives. And they made their own choices in their lives. And it was indeed a period of history when God grieved because the choices and the lives 
that these people were making and living were evil. So one day, God, with a breaking heart, he sent a famine to Bethlehem. And God sent the famine because God's intention for this disaster was for his people to look back to him. Because as sad as it is to admit, we humans sometimes only learn to look to God and only learn to come back to God when we suffer. Sometimes. But not always. Not always. And Elimelech, a man from Bethlehem, a man with a name that means God is my king, he didn't choose to look to his king even after the famine. Instead, he went to the field of Moab to run away from God. And not only fleeing was a bad idea, but Moab wasn't a good place to flee either because Moab was a nation that was constantly standing against in the way of God and the way of his people. Not only were they a nation that started through an incest and grieved God, but Moab was also a nation that hindered the people of God to be the people of God with both military and religious hindrances. But without God, but without God, if we take God out of the picture, Moab was a reasonable place to go for Elimelech because in Bethlehem, there was no food. But in Moab, there was food. So Elimelech took his wife and his sons to the field of Moab to live there. But unfortunately for Elimelech, his plans didn't work out. Because Elimelech and all of his sons, both of his sons, they went there to live, but they all died in the land of Moab. And when all of the men of the house were dead, Naomi was left with her two daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah. Then one day, Naomi heard that God has given food to his people back at home. So after losing her husband and her son, with a complete despair, but with tiny little bit of hope for food, Naomi decides to come back home. And in the way back home, Orpah, one of the daughters-in-law, she makes a completely reasonable and understandable choice to stay in Moab. And she goes back to her mother's house. But Ruth, she makes a completely irrational choice. And she decides to stay with her mother-in-law. And she chooses to go to Bethlehem with Naomi. Now she knew that there will be racism against her in Bethlehem. And she knew that there will be people snickering behind her back just because she was a Moabite. But nonetheless, she chooses to stay with Naomi because she wants to take care of this poor old lady. But back at home, back at Bethlehem, there was no food waiting for these people. There was no food waiting for these poor widows. They had no family to welcome them. They had no men to protect them, which was important back in those days because women were vulnerable back in the ancient Middle East. So, but there they were. Ruth and Naomi, completely helpless, completely defenseless, just hoping to find mercy from an owner of a farm who would mercifully allow them to glean. And then that's when they met Boaz. In this hostile, unfortunate, and dangerous time of their lives, they meet a merciful man named Boaz. And from the very moment Ruth and Boaz met, Boaz was kind to her, to this girl from Moab. Ruth, the Moabite, that's how, she been, that's how she has been called in the town. And that's how she had to be called because she is from Moab. But every time when people said Ruth the Moabite, they knew what that actually really meant. Yet, that's not what Boaz saw. From the beginning, what he focused on was not what other people were snickering behind her. Instead, what he focused was what Ruth had done right. Because what she had done was beyond and above what was expected to be the right thing to do for her mother-in-law. Again, we have to remember that this was a time of judges. And Israelites were behaving nothing like how the people of God should have behaved. 
Because if they behaved like the people of God and the community of God should have behaved, Naomi and Ruth should not have any difficulties to make living without their husbands. Because according to the law that was given to the people of God, the farm owners should have left plenty behind when they harvested so that the strangers and those people who are in need can glean from the field. And according to the law, Naomi and Ruth should have been contacted and reached out by the relatives of Elimelech so that they can redeem the land that used to be in the possession of Elimelech before he left Moab. Because according to the law, the land should never be sold in perpetuity. It should always come back to the original family. So according to the law, according to the law that God gave to his people, Ruth and Naomi should have enjoyed the security and safety provided by the community that belongs to God. But as we all know, as it is written, none of that was happening. None of that. No one was keeping the law as it was intended to be kept. Because no one was keeping the law of God by loving and protecting one another. The law was given to them so that they can learn to love God and love one another like God loves them. But no one was keeping that law. Yet, here it was. Not an Israelite, but a Moabite. Loving, loving and protecting her mother-in-law. Not by the rules of the law. She wasn't even the subject of the law because she was not even an Israelite. But by the spirit of the law, she loved and protected her mother-in-law. And Boaz saw that. And from then on, the Bible tells us about his merciful actions for her. He first guarantees her safety by meeting up with her needs. He makes sure that no one harms her on the field as she gleans. He makes sure that she goes home with enough food for herself and for her mother-in-law. And he makes sure that his men know about this protection. But then later on, Ruth comes to Boaz saying that he is actually one of the relatives that should keep her safe by taking her under his wings by marrying her. But what she was demanding was now really crossing the line. Because, first of all, back in those days, women were not allowed to say things like that. And in Israel, Moabites could not talk to Israelites like that. Also, as it turned out, Boaz was not even the first in line to redeem the land or to take care of Naomi and Ruth. And he was not a brother of Elimelech, but only a relative. So he did not have to take her under his wing as his wife. Now, Again, according to the law, if a married man died without having a son, his brother was to sleep with the wife of the deceased so that she can have a child, a son to carry out the name of the deceased. And this might sound really odd to our ears, but we have to remember that it was very dangerous time for a woman to live alone back in those days. She needed a man to protect her. It was just like that. And in the times when people were not ethically and morally attuned, God had to give them this law of leverage marriage so that the widows of Israel did not get abandoned by the people of God and by the community of God. And Ruth was asking Boaz to fulfill this law for her. But Boaz didn't have to do it. He didn't have to do it at all because he was not a brother of Elimelech. He didn't have that responsibility to take care of these women for Elimelech. That's not what the law said. He's not a brother. Plus, he has somebody else, a closer relative who should fulfill the law if he desires. And this was a time of judges. So no one was to blame Boaz, even if he rejected and abandoned Naomi and Ruth. Because 
no one was eager to keep the law anyways. In fact, it would have been a reasonable course of action for most of people to abandon these widows. And that's what the other closer relative chose to do. He looked at the circumstances and he saw that this could be dangerous for him. If he redeems the land and takes Ruth under his wing as his wife, there was a risk for him to lose a lot of his money and reputation because after all, Ruth is a Moabite. And if she gives birth to a son, this boy will not become his son, but he'll be carrying out the name of Malone, the son of Elimelech who died in, in Moab. And later on, when this boy grows up, he will be claiming his inheritance. He will be redeeming the land for his father's name. So the closer relative, the kinsman redeemer, he didn't have to think for too long. He had to think about his own name. He had to think about his own reputation. He had to think about his own well-being. So although it was unfortunate for Naomi and Ruth and Elimelech who will be forgotten, this man had to say no to Ruth. And it was a reasonable decision. But Boaz, but Boaz, when it was his turn to say yes or no in marrying Ruth and redeeming that land and giving a son not for himself but for his deceased relative, he takes no time to reach out. And he embraces this poor girl. He gladly takes her as his wife. He gladly buys the land for Limelech's name. And he gladly chooses to risk his own reputation and his wealth and his future for this family who needs his help. But compared to the man who made that reasonable choice for his name, Boaz was making an irrational and a risky decision. Here's the thing. Nobody knows. Nobody remembers the name of this closer relative. In the Hebrew Bible, his name is recorded as Almoni Pomoni, but this is just a meaningless phrase. It's not even a name. And although the Bible doesn't speak anything negatively about this man, this man is forgotten in the history. But that's exactly what he feared. And it's quite the opposite of what he had in his mind when he said no to Ruth, when he chose to abandon this girl. But Boaz, we all remember his name. Although he said that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian, and Malon, I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malone's wife, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records, it is his name, Boaz, that did not disappear. It is his name, Boaz, that got maintained. It is his name, Boaz, that we remember. Now, we've come a long way to come to today's passage. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Minadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. But according to the law, according to what Boaz had expected, Obed should have been called as a son of Malone. And Jesse and David should have been called as the grandson and the great-grandson of Malone. And later on, years and years later on, when God keeps his promise by giving his son to us, when the son of God came to us as a man, according to the law, the genealogy of Jesus Christ should have included Malone. Not Boaz. But God did not allow that. God did not allow the name of Boaz to be forgotten. 
he maintained and kept and passed on his name. Because Boaz kept the law. But not by setting his limits according to the limits of the law. But he went above and beyond because he had the law. He had the law of God written in his heart. And the law that was written in his heart was telling him and driving him and empowering him to love. It was freeing him to love like God loves. For the law of God does not only teach us where to stop, but it also teaches us and frees us to go with love. And keeping Boaz in the genealogy of Jesus Christ was God's way of rewarding Boaz. Now, of course, we don't live our lives just to win prizes or gain rewards from God. But from the life of Boaz, I see our God who wants to reward us. I see our God who wants to compliment us when we do what is the only right thing to do by loving one another. Because what we do to each other, what I do to you and what you do to me, what we do to each other matters to God. And it matters very much to Him. And I believe in this genealogy, that's what God wants us to hear. So that we can also live like Boaz. By trusting our God who wants to bless us. And who is eager to reward us. When we love one another like He loves us. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you because you are our God who loves us and blesses us. And we thank you because you are our God who desires to pour out your love and your blessing upon us. So Father, make us into your vessel. Make us into the people that you want us to be so that we may receive all the blessings and the love that you want us to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us close our service with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.